All right, thank you. And thanks for the kind introduction. As mentioned, my name is Gregor Dice, and I'm from the University of Stuttgart. And today I want to talk about uh, integrating COCOS with HBX. As you might imagine, I didn't work on this all on my own. In fact, it has been a collaborative effort, uh, mostly between three institutions, the University of Stuttgart here in Germany, the CSCS in Switzerland, and the Louisiana State University. So let's jump uh, straight in. So as we all know, developing uh, applications for high performance computing isn't exactly straightforward. We have a lot of requirements for the compute kernels and well, we want efficient CPU execution. We want it to be able to run on the GPU. We want it to be performance portable between the two, of course. And depending on the scenario, we might actually want to try out different memory layouts. At the same time, naturally, the simulation shouldn't just run on one compute node alone. Instead, we want it to run on an entire cluster. So we have some specific uh, communication requirements. So for example, if we do an implementation with MPI, we need to take manually care of overlapping the computation with the communication, not to mention the IO issues. Then as we uh, throw GPUs into the mix, then suddenly we want to overlap it with GPU and CPU data transfers as well. And of course, in the end, it hopefully should scale well. Now, as everybody is having the same issues, naturally, there's a solution to every problem. So for the uh, performance portability and targeting different accelerators, we can use the COCOS framework. And for the communication and the entire overlapping issues, we can use HPX, which is a distributed task-based uh, runtime system. Now. While there is a solution to every issue, and well, basically here there's a framework for every issue, uh, using them together is a different question. For example, how can we launch a COCOS kernel and have it integrated into the task graph of HBX without it being synchronous? Well, that's exactly the kind of question I want to answer in this talk. So uh, in the remainder of the talk, I will first talk about the frameworks themselves. So I will give a brief introduction into COCOS and HBX. Afterwards, I want to talk about the integrations we did, integrating uh, COCOS with HBX and vice versa. And afterwards, I want to quickly introduce a simulation that we use as a benchmark. It's called OctoTiger. You can always see in the headers uh, where we are currently at at the presentation. And lastly, of course, I want to talk about the results. Now, as for COCOS itself, the best description of COCOS I've seen so far is basically the one that is written just here. It's a performance portability library, which allows us to avoid having to rewrite uh, every time we encounter a new architecture. Uh, to do that, COCOS um, exposes a couple of abstractions that we can use, which can be broadly categorized into two uh, categories. For one, we have the uh, parallel execution abstractions which basically uh, we can tell COCOS how we want a kernel to be uh, executed. So of course there are execution spaces. For example, we want the kernel that we give to COCOS uh, to be executed with OpenMP or with CUDA or HIP. And of course uh, the kernel that we pass to COCOS is essentially just a function or maybe even a Lambda function. So we also need to specify uh, what kind of parallel pattern it is. Um, uh, we want to have it used. So for example, the uh, most common one I think is just a parallel four, but there are also other parallel patterns um, supported like reduce or scan. Now that we have done that, uh, for example, with a parallel four, it would just execute from like iteration one to N, but of course we need to tell Cocker somehow um, what the range is. And for that, we have execution policies. Uh, the simplest one is the one I just uh, mentioned, where we just tell it, well, we want the kernel to run from 1 to n. But there are also other policies which are multidimensional or team policies, which also include some um, specifications about the workgroup sizes, which is essential on uh, CUDA hardware, for example, to use shared memory. Also, while it's not usually mentioned in the Caucus introduction slides, at least not the ones I have seen so far, there are some D extensions available uh, developed by the Caucus people. I think they are mostly not mentioned because they are still sort of experimental, but I found them to be tremendously handy, so I decided to include them here. 
essentially what it is, uh, it's SIMD with data types. So on, if we execute a kernel on the CPU, we can use, for example, the AVX operations. Uh, on the GPU, we would just say, well, leave it scalar so everything will boil down to doubles and the um, appropriate operations for that. Now, I only talked about executions. Uh, to complete the picture, of course, we need the memory abstractions, namely the memory spaces. So Cocos has a buffer class, which is called Cocos Fuse, where we can just uh, specify where the memory should actually live. For example, we can say, okay, it should be in pinned memory on the host side. The array should live in the device memory of some CUDA device. Or for shared memory usage, we can say, oh, this is supposed to be in the scratch memory. There are different memory layouts supported, for example, tiled or strided, and you can actually specify some traits as well to just tell, uh, well, we want it to run on, for example, atomic access. Now, HBX, on the other hand, is, as I mentioned, a distributed asynchronous task-based runtime system, which is quite a mouthful. So let's break it down. It's distributed. It supports unified C++ syntax for both local and remote operations. So you basically distribute your data among all the different processes or localities, and HBX keeps track of them using a global address space. Address space. And for the actual functions calls and data transfers, they require there are different uh, communication backends available or PAR supports, for example, which uh, use MPI in the background or libfabric. I think there's even a TCP one, but that's not one I have used so far. Now. It's also task-based, so the syntax here should look familiar because it's really similar to the C++ syntax, which is, of course, intentional. So we can just use uh, HBX async, for example, to launch some uh, function, and in the end, we get a future back. We can use the future to uh, combine this with other tasks to, in the end, build an uh, asynchronous, uh, sorry, uh, this, basically a task graph. So. And well, lastly, what uh, sets this apart from C++ uh, standard giving tasks a bit is also that, well, we have a thread pool of worker threads which will uh, execute the tasks. And each time a worker thread is finished with a task, it will simply get another one. Then, of course, we can suspend the task by, for example, if we within the task need the result of another one, we call future get. Uh, if that future isn't ready, we will just uh, suspend the current task. And once a worker thread is finished with a task and realizes it has no more work to do, then it's quite happy to actually steal work from other worker threads. So we have some kind of load balancing going on here as well. Now I can show you an example of such a graph. So for example, we can just say, okay, I have the task one. For that, I get the future one. And to um, basically build the graph, we can just put, put in a, con a continuation like this with the dot then. Um, of course, there are more methods available for this kind of thing. So we can uh, chain multiple tasks onto one future. And of course, we can also have an end-to-one mapping for when all or when any. And that's essentially all I wanted to say about HBX uh, for it uh, for now. So now let's get to the integrations. What do we want to have? What we want to have is basically being able to replace some tasks with actual Cocos kernels, but still build all of the tasking craft uh, the same way that we did before. So basically, it should look like this. For course, we have a few requirements to achieve that. First of all, we need to futurize the kernel launchers. By that, I simply mean if we launch a kernel, for example, on a CUDA device using Cocos, we need to get back an HBX future, which then we can use to uh, just chain continuations. Of course, uh, usually we have more than one worker thread, so it's not like some kind of fork join thing per se, but otherwise we basically have, for example, uh, 10 worker threads for a 10 core machine, and all of them will be launching kernels. Now, ideally, if we do that, uh, we already have a thread pool. So if we run a Cocos kernel, not on a GPU device, but on the host side, we wanted to use the available thread pool in HBX and not try to use, for example, some kind of OpenMP thread pool. And lastly, of course, uh, the integration should work for both host side and device side executions. So for example, Cocos kernel one could be on the device, Cocos kernel four uh, on the host. Okay, so let's get to the 
actually not the first of those requirements, but the second and third, because that's the easier point to start. So our first integration is uh, a Cocos um, execution space uh, using HBX. So what we do is when we start a Cocos kernel, for example, with Parallel 4, we map it onto uh, a set of HBX tasks, which is basically um, this what you can see here. So essentially, it's really simple because we, you have the Parallel 4, you know, okay, I have my chunks of work, so I just map it to tasks. Of course, we also support reduce and other uh, patterns. And once we have that, we know we have the when all uh, continuation uh, functionality available within HBX. So it's actually easy to get a future back from that. And naturally, um, this is not the only way of running stuff on the CPU with Cocos. Uh, while we don't want to have any conflicting thread pools, there's also the Cocos serial backend. Now, while this usually is sort of bad because it only uses one core, as we already um, use HBX for multi-core um, purposes, so we have N worker threads, for example, it's quite fine if a worker thread launches its own Cocos serial kernel and works on it uh, by itself. This is rather handy if you know the data is already in the cache, for example. Also, what is nice about the integration is we literally only needed to add the execution space. There was no need to modify any memory spaces within Cocos or anything like that. And now if we actually run a Cocos kernel on the HPX backend, it depends on how many threads will actually execute. It. For example, here we could uh, have M threads executed, but if we have less cores than that and thus less worker threads, uh, one worker thread might, for example, just work on task two, because why not? It's uh, for HPX, it's just tasks. And of course, it's, as I mentioned, quite easy now to launch it from basically any worker thread or any task because in the end, it's just uh, more HBX threads and more HBX tasks that get spawned. Now, this is the first integration, but it doesn't really solve the whole futurized uh, issue. So let's get further ahead. There's a second integration. For that, we actually introduce HBX Cocos, which is a SYN integration layer that basically sits on top of Cocos. And in the most important functionality within that are the executors. Each executor manages one uh, Cocos execution space and can provide futures for all kernels that run on it. So for example, you launch a kernel using that execution space and you tell the executors, I'd like to have a HPX future for that. Now, this is quite trivial for the host kernels, as I mentioned earlier, because while well, we are, for example, in the HPX backend in Cocos already using, uh, for the HPX execution space already using HPX, so it's easy to get a future back. The more interesting part is how to use that for the um, device execution. Now let's take a look at that. So for that, we actually need to go down a bit and look at HPX and CUDA in particular, because there we can actually visualize this. So assume we have a CUDA stream down here where a CUDA kernel is, has already been scheduled and it's running. And within the HPX application, we now want the future to be able to chain more tasks to it. So what we do, we call get future, and HBX offers a functionality which will simply insert a CUDA callback into the stream and returns the future. Now, HBX now doesn't do, have to do anything. Instead, once the uh, kernel execution down here on the device is finished, the callback will be triggered, and within the callback, we will set the value of the future and set the entire HBX future to ready, meaning the scheduler is now free to um, launch tasks that depended on this task. So this is actually a quite uh, easy way of integrating HPX with uh, CUDA device kernels, because as soon as the kernel is finished and the callback is triggered, uh, HPX knows about it and can trigger subsequent tasks. This is not the only way of integrating stuff, though, because there's also CUDA device side execution with polling. So it still looks similar. So we assume the kernel has already been launched in whatever way. And in the HPX application, we want to get the future again. This time, we uh, actually insert within HPX a CUDA event into the CUDA stream. And this time, HPX, the HPX scheduler actually keeps track of it in the form of, well, uh, the CUDA event itself. So each time the scheduler is finished with a task, it will simply take a quick look. Is the event finished? Yes, no. If not, it will simply continue with the next task. But at a certain point, the event will be set. <clears throat> 
And the next time the scheduler is polling, it will realize, oh, this task is done. So we can set the future to ready. So those are two different types of uh, integrating CUDA with HBX. It actually works very similarly for, uh, for example, HIP. And on itself, it's not quite um, clear which one of the two is the better one. So we will take a look at some performance data later on in the presentation. Now to sum it up, we basically have uh, the two integrations I mentioned. We have the CUDA and TIP device executives within HBX Cocos now, which use exactly the functionality I just mentioned for the uh, for getting a future. So we they just take their own execution space, for example, the CUDA execution space, extract the CUDA stream from them from that, and tell HBX I'd like to have a future for that. And the future will be ready as soon as the uh, all of the stuff that is currently executed within that CUDA stream is being finished. On the host side, we have the HBX um, execution space now, and of course the serial execution space, a space which works rather fine with HBX together. The kernel launchers and data transfers actually are now integrated with HBX futures. And well, we can actually interface with plain Cocos by simply returning the execution space of a executor and just call uh, all Cocos functionality as we would usually do. Of course, this is not all there is to HBX Cockers. There are a bunch of um, convenience functions, really, but they are building on top of the executors. So, for example, instead of using a Cockers Parallel 4, which you feed with an execution space that you get from an executor, you can just say, well, I use HBX Parallel 4 and, well, give it the executor. This works as well. So, they are really the integration here where we have. Uh, Interface Cocos with HBX using the Cocos execution space. HBX Cocos uses HBX itself to get the futures for any device side execution. And lastly, of course, an application that uses HBX, like for example, OctoTiger, will be integrated with Cocos as well, uh, with HBX as well for the communication part. Now, as you might imagine, there's a lot that can go wrong here. So, for example, you can introduce overheads at basically any time of this and um, integration or well to find out how well it really works we wanted to have a benchmark example that goes beyond the usual uh, CUDA stre uh, stream benchmark for example like one that really benefits from the integrations so for that purpose we uh, come to the real world benchmark and that is uh, done with OctoTiger. OctoTiger is an astrophysics uh, simulation simulating binary star systems and their merger on the right side, uh, right hand side, you can actually see a snapshot of one of such mergers, uh, which is from a rather recent press release about OctoTiger. Now, OctoTiger has the advantage of being uh, developed from ground up as a distributed HBX application, and it actually benefits a lot from um, the asynchronous kernel launches that we can do with HBX. So essentially, we actually need the integrations that I mentioned in the last section to even properly integrate Cocos within HBX, uh, within OctoTiger. Otherwise, we, for example, we can't just uh, launch one kernel with Cocos and have it synchronized because we want to launch quite a lot of them in parallel. But I will come to that uh, in a minute. Also, the second reason is there's a performant VC and CUDA implementation already which is rather handy to um, investigate the entire performance portability claim to see how well uh, the Cocos implementation is working against that. And lastly, of course, uh, it's as an advantage for OctoTiger itself a bit because porting it to Cocos opens it up for more hardware platforms, like for example, uh, AMD GPUs. Now let's jump right into OctoTiger. I called it OctoTiger in a nutshell because uh, I'm lacking the time to actually show you everything. So let's boil it down. What OctoTiger does, it models stars as self-gravitating fluids and uses an AMR grid to do so. And we can already see all of the required components here. We have a gravity server, which is using the fast multiple method. This has to be solved uh, in every time step of the uh, hydrodynamic solver, which in turn uses a finite volumes uh, solver in order to get the Navier-Stokes equation solved. And lastly, this entire simulation is highly adaptive, so it uses an AMR grid. Each of the um, nodes within, each of the three nodes within that tree is actually a subgrid, usually by the size of eight by eight by eight, as you can see here. 
Now, if we go further ahead, we can see, okay, the hotspot in the gravity and the octotiger simulation is usually the gravity module simply because it has to be solved for every time step. And well, people familiar with the FMM probably know, but we usually have uh, three uh, steps for that. We have to compute the multiples in a bottom up tree traversal, as you can see here. Then we have to compute the same level, uh, same level interactions. And lastly, all of this comes together and we have to do another um, step within the tree, like a top down traversal to compute the actual expansions that we need for the gravity. Now, as you can imagine, this is quite handy for a tasking framework because tree traversals are a lot easier to do with, um, well, expressed in a task graph than you would just use a parallel for. So HPX is rather handy here. The actual kernels that we use Cocos for will be uh, just operating each on one of those subgrids, so eight by eight by eight subgrids. Now I mark this second step here uh, with blue because that is by far the most compute, uh, computational expensive one for that. And I will show you why in a second. So there is this opening criterion which defines whether a cell should interact with another cell. And well, I mentioned that we have 512 cells per subgrid. With all the neighbors, you have uh, well 26 more neighbors to look at. And each of these cells by the, uh, has around 1,074 interaction partners if you use uh, zeta equals 0 0.34, which is our usual production uh, run value. So instead of like in the first FMM step and the uh, third FMM step, we don't just have to look at the um, values of all children of a cell, but instead of 1,074 uh, interaction partners on the same level. So as I mentioned, this is by far the most computationally expensive step of the three. Now there are multiple uh, variants of this kernel. That's simply because uh, a subgrid can either be uh, multiple or monopole, depending on whether it's refined or not. And while we are solving for the same equations, uh, for example, a monopole-monopole interaction is a lot easier because most of the stuff would actually just compute to zero. So we don't even bother and use a specialized kernel for that. And as you can uh, might imagine, there are uh, some other interaction types and we always try to compute as less, uh, the least amount of floating points operations that uh, are possible. So usually it ranges per interaction between 12 floating point operations in double position and 455 for multiple multiple interaction. Well, as I mentioned, we have a already a rather efficient implementation in VC and CUDA, but now we have ported all of the required kernels for this second step from VC CUDA to COCOS. Uh, we have done that all by hand. It actually has been a couple of thousand lines of code with all of the uh, kernels and all of the supporting code structures that we required. So it was quite a bit of an effort. So naturally, after this kind of effort, we were curious how well it performs. So let's uh, jump to our last section, the actual results. So we used a normal machine with a Xeon uh, CPU, just 10 cores and a uh, more recent GPU uh, V100. For the V100, we use up to 128 device executors simply because it uh, should support up to 128 concurrent CUDA streams. The scenario we run in OctoTiger is a gravity only scenario. So it's all three FMM steps. And of course, all of the uh, surrounding support code like the uh, conversion of data structures, data transfers, this kind of thing. Now, the scenario itself, uh, we use a lot, rather small grid for OctoTiger standard simply because we only use it for on one compute node for now. So it's just for three levels resulting in, uh, well, 1,673 subgrids, most of them unrefined ones, of course. So the measured runtime that follows will always include all uh, the steps, so it measures the entire solver. And we average this over 50 iterations to get a more accurate output. Now, the goals of our tests are actually test all of the HBX Cocos integrations under a rather high load. So the kernels that we run per subgrid are sort of short running. I mean, we are talking about a couple of hundred microseconds to uh, single digit milliseconds. And those are launched uh, on the CPU on up to 10 cores and, of course, on the GPU with 128 device executors. <laughs> 
Also, we want, of course, to compare the performance with the previous implementation using VC and CUDA and see how we are doing with Cockers. And lastly, of course, I mentioned this earlier, we have two ways of synchronizing uh, futures on the device. So we can use callbacks or event polling, and we will take a look at both. So the first results are just uh, on the CPU, ignoring the GPU for now. On the left-hand side, you can see a table where we um, listed the different runs. The first run is our baseline, which is the previous implementation. So for all multiple kernels that are run on refined subgrid and all monopole kernels that are run on unrefined subgrids, we are using VC, which in turn uses, of course, AVX2 for uh, SMD instructions. And our baseline tells us, well, one solver iteration on one core would take about five seconds or, well, half a second roughly on 10 cores. So the speed up is actually not that bad, but currently we are only talking about 10 CPU cores, of course. Then the second run is using the new Cocos kernels on the CPU. And we are currently using the Cocos serial execution space. So each HBX worker thread is executing its own kernel. So it encounters a subgrid, the kernel gets launched, and it immediately starts to work on this uh, kernel on this very specific subgrid. And here we already see why I was quite keen on mentioning that Cocos also supported some D extensions, because for the first run, we actually didn't use them. And it got a lot worse than it has been with VC. So sometimes the auto vectorization worked, sometimes it didn't. It wasn't that beautiful. So in our second attempt, we actually ported all of the Cocos kernels to use the Cocos and D extensions. So we have explicit vectorization again via data types. And now we actually are beating the uh, VC results by a small margin, but this is rather good considering the VC kernels were already highly optimized. Now, so far we only have run everything on the Cocker serial backend, but as I mentioned, we also have the um, Cocker's HBX backend. So first of all, we run the multiple kernels on the Cocker's HBX backend and the monopole kernels on the Cocker serial backend. And unfortunately, here the runtime degrades somewhat. And this is not that surprising because all of the cores were already utilized by the uh, serial backend simply because we uh, launched them with all HBX worker threads. So using the HBX backend doesn't gain us anything here. It would gain us something if it's some kind of kernel where all other worker threads are, for example, waiting upon uh, until it's finished. But this isn't the case here. And as you might imagine, this gets worse if we run everything on the Cocos HBX backend, but it still stays somewhat comparable to the uh, best results, which is the Cocos serial backend with explicit vectorization. Also, I might add there's a lot going on here. So we're talking about a couple of thousand kernel launches within uh, just a half a second here. So yeah, the best average VC run, as you can see, it's a bit slower than the average best Cocos run. So, and well, as we, as I mentioned, it's also sufficient to just use the serial backend in this kind of use case. I would recommend using the HBX backend if you actually have larger kernels where all of the other tasks are waiting upon. Now let's get to the GPU results. So this scenario is picking off where the other one left off. So we are always uh, using 10 cores now on the CPU side. And now we slowly start to increase our number of device executors using the GPU. So let's start with the uh, solid clients, which, um, I'm sorry, not solid, the uh, green and red lines here. And because those are the most interesting runs. For those runs, we schedule all available kernels on the executors that are there. So we use, um, for example, here, well up here, only one executor meaning we launch everything, all of the kernels in the entire scenario within one executor. And as I mentioned, the kernels themselves are rather small. You will usually rely on running multiple kernels concurrently on the GPU using multiple CUDA streams, for example. And if we don't do that, we count exactly that scenario that the runtime actually gets worse than the CPU only runtime. But if we increase the number of executors, as you can see, the runtime will quickly uh, decrease. And it's, decreasing about the same for the VC implementation, uh, for, I'm sorry, for the CUDA implementation and the Cocos implementation. And well, 
you can see in Queen, the CUDA implementation is slightly better actually than the Cocos implementation. And that's due to one missing optimization. We usually have a rather large stencil. So we put that into constant memory for CUDA and we had some trouble doing the same with Cocos, unfortunately. And it's noticeable in the monopole kernels. Now, this is using polling. If we do the exactly same run, uh, with callbacks, you will have to look instead of the dashed lines at the solid lines. So it's the solid red and green lines. And as you can see here, the callbacks are performing worse. If you increase the number of used executors, it will slowly approach the performance of the uh, polling version, but it's never getting quite there. That's simply because if you have a CUDA stream and the CUDA stream has to execute a callback, the stream will block until the callback is done. While there's not a lot to do within the callback, um, it's noticeable. The polling, on the other hand, is a lot quicker. So um, that is basically four of the runs explained. There are the orange and blue runs left, and those are runs where we use both the CPU and the GPU. Now, this is rather interesting, simply because uh, as we have a pool of device executors, we can query it whether it's currently busy. So if we start off with um, zero executors, there will, all, there will never be a free executor if we query them. So it basically is exactly the same as the CPU runs in the last slide. Now, if we start adding the executors, uh, more and more work will slowly be offloaded to the GPU. And if that's currently, uh, if there's no executor available, then we will just run it on the CPU. Now, in our case, the GPU is a lot more powerful than the CPU. So usually we just want to use the maximum number of executors. But it's interesting to see because if we have a system where we have a more powerful CPU, we would benefit a lot more here. So, and well, you can see even here, the polling is consistently better than the callback version, basically for the same reasons. Now, it's nice to keep in mind, as I said, that this includes thousands of GPU kernel launches within just a, well, 158 microseconds, which is the fastest one. It includes all data transfers. And most importantly, it also includes all of the uh, first and third FMM steps and any data conversions that are required to interface with the old code part of OctoTiger. So there's actually a hard limit that we can reach in the runtime by adding the GPU, simply because the first and second step within the FMM are not ported to GPU yet. But the most important takeaway here is that well, it's actually working as intended. So there's no significant overheads to be seen between the Cocos implementation using HPX Cocos and a lot of uh, device executors and the same run with the CUDA executors. So this is working just as intended. And this actually already brings me to my conclusions. So what we have seen here, we have integrated HPX and Cocos to basically complement each other. So. Cocos gains the HPX execution space and a, ni a nice tasking framework, which also allows to integrate it with the communications in between compute nodes, for example. So it's not just a GPU tasking graph. And well, HPX on the other hand, of course, gets all of the uh, benefits of having a performance portable way of running kernels. So it's really the best of two worlds. Also, a uh, third contribution is, of course, OctoTiger itself. So porting it to Cocos, uh, well, we use it for the tests, but as I mentioned, it's also really beneficial for OctoTiger itself. So we found that our new kernels and the integrations are performing either better or at least equivalent to the um, previous implementations. But with the added advantage of A, it's possible to run it on different architectures. And B, I don't have to maintain two kernels uh, two versions of the same kernel because previously I had to maintain a VC kernel and a CUDA kernel just for the monopole monopole interactions, for example. And now all of this is unified. Lastly, I just want to thank all of my co authors, especially Mikael, who I believe is currently attending this, this presentation. And that actually brings me to my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Gregor. Uh, it's it's a very interesting work and uh, talk. Yeah. So uh, we got a nice question from Jeremy Jin, and uh, he asked, "How many GPUs do you use for 128 executors?" Ah, I actually forgot to mention that it's only one GPU. So it's basically the device limit as per NVIDIA that you just use 100, 
28 exec uh, sorry executors CUDA streams because more won't be parallel. You can always create more, but you won't see any benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I spend a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I already uh, see, seen the yeah, uh, uh, other question. Yeah. Okay. So basically. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, so, uh, because I'm, yeah, I was just curious because I, I think that usually uh, if we create 32 stream, it is it's already a lot. And, um, and uh, for some kernel, we don't see performance improvement when we increase the number of stream from from maybe two to four or from four, four, four to eight or eight to 16. So, but what I see is that um, you can get a, a still almost get continuous uh, improve performance improvement um, with uh, I think maybe around like with 32 stream. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so, so, so I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Uh -huh. I can explain that. It's simply because our compute kernels are rather small. So remember that we operate on a subgrid with 512 grid cells. So as you have seen with one CUDA stream, so one executor, we actually get really bad performance. And that's simply due to that. It's not enough to utilize a GPU at all. So it gets better when you launch multiple of the GPU kernels concurrently using different executors being launched by different or the same HBX worker thread. So suddenly you increase the load on your device and the yeah. NVIDIA runtime here is actually rather nice because it allows the kernels to run concurrently if the streams are independent of each other. Oh, so, so the performance bottleneck is the, actually is not the kernel itself. It is actually the, the data the communication right between host and device because you are you're trying to use the many streams to, to overlap, uh, how do you say, to, to, to overlap communication with uh, memory transfer and also make all uh, in addition to uh, uh is that right so it's uh, not quite the compute kernels are actually compute bound um mm -hmm. it's simply because for example if we use a p100 because i know uh, that architecture a bit better we have 56 um, of the streaming processors and mm -hmm. if you look at a kernel with 512 elements we launch it with a grid with eight grid blocks so we basically not even close to utilizing the device, even if each of those blocks is run on one streaming multiprocessor. And so we benefit a lot by simply going up to 10 executors, for example. And you could see that I think I can still go back a bit. Let me show it in the graph. Ah, here it was. So you can see that here. At first, our execution time improves a lot by adding more executors. This is basically the point where we are getting close to utilize the device. And afterwards, the a bit uh, worse uh, improvements that we get are more to the data uh, transfers that are being overlapped with the execution. So we still see benefit, but it sort of levels off. I hope I could answer your question. Oh, sorry. So, so the sharp uh, decrease uh, in the beginning is is due to the uh, the the par parallel execution of the kernel, right? And then after after that, it is due to the overlapping between uh, between computation and uh, and the communication. Yes. Is... Let's see. Yeah. So I've seen the other question in the chat: How long it took us to port uh, everything? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, it was a couple of thousand lines of code. I'd say two months, but it was based along uh, basically half a year. So it's um, a bit fussy, but it took us quite a while because it's really easy to do uh, mistakes while porting it. And suddenly everything looks great. And then you run a longer simulation and you see these small errors adding up and you realize you have done a tiny mistake and then you spend quite a while looking for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's especially big... yeah, especially yeah. the merging of the CUDA and VC kernels was a bit tough as well. Because of course at first they were separate, but for the Cocos kernels, it's calling the same code. So we just instance it with a difference in D types for the GPU execution than for the host execution, but it's still the same method otherwise. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Yeah. So any other questions? <clears throat> All right. I think that's all. Yeah, that's all for this. Thank you so much, uh, Gregor. Thank yeah, you for the nice presentation. Yeah, great.